our final review for the 12 great lessons which we have studied covering the success attitude for ministry. And as we review uh, these uh, 12 great lessons, these 12, maybe I should say vital lessons, uh, remember that the purpose of our study is set forth in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, be an example of the believer in six ways, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. That's in 1 Timothy 4, 12, verse 13, to give, a, that we are to give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. That's what we're studying for, isn't it? Say, so that's what I'm here for. Verse 14, that we might neglect not the gift that's in us. Say, I don't want to neglect my gift. And verse 15, we're told to meditate on these things and give ourselves wholly to them. Then 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, work people, persons working, who need not be ashamed rightly dividing the words of truth. Say, I believe in that. And then 1 Corinthians 2.12, we have received, uh, this is not part of the test, but, but this is a verse that's very important. We have received not the spirit of the world. Say, I haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. And then it says that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's what I want to know, don't you? What God gives to me. And then it says in verse 14, the natural person receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned, but we have what? We have the mind of Christ. Say, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. Now that's just, that's just a... That's just to cook your, to get you cooking, get you ready for this review today. We have the mind of Christ. Now, concluding these 12 vital lessons today, this concludes the first course of winning our world. Course one. Course two is coming up. But to give you a little uh, uh, outline of ideals or to capsulize our attitude, because that's what we've been studying, because everything starts with attitude. Let me give you these three fresh lines that have nothing to do with the test, but that will inspire you for your future. Three facts to remember. Number one, that God values me. Say that. God values me. To always remember that, never forget that, I will look at the cross. You believe that? Number two, God trusts me. I will look to the Great Commission. Number three, God needs me. I will look to my world. Now, those are just primers and focusers of attitude. Say that. God values me. God values me. I, will I will look at the cross. God trusts me. God trusts me. I'll, look I'll look at the Great Commission. God needs me. God needs I'll, look at people. I'll look at people. That help you? Now, let's go for the review for our exam today and see uh, what we can uh, uh, stack up and uh, you'll be given your exam paper at the end of this class. Let's remember that the focus, uh, you won't need to write this down because it's, it'll be written on your exam paper, the focus of the first quarter of Winning Our World Bible Course centers on development of a right attitude for success in life as a representative of Jesus Christ. Now, that's what we all are. We represent Jesus in our world. If we're not, 
if we're not composed, if that's not our status, if that's not our comportment, our posture, then we haven't caught on to what our salvation is all about. We are a witness of Jesus Christ to hurting people around us. And remember, now this isn't part of the test, remember that only as we assimilate truth and let it become flesh and blood can we say we've learned it. We haven't learned until it goes into action. You don't stack knowledge in your head or your spirit, wherever that is. You produce knowledge. You reproduce knowledge. Truth is a person. Truth is life. You got that? Okay, that's not part of the test. Now, question number one will deal with four statements. I think you'll remember these, just a reminder. Number one, what's God's dream, people? What does God will for people? Good. What does God never give up on? Say it louder. God is what? Huh? Spirit. And we are what? Yeah, you're good. And qu question number two, what does wow stand for? Say it together. Question number three, there are three influences, factors, that we have emphasized during the early lessons of this course that will have an effect upon your attitude. The first one is the word. The second one is the world. The third one is the witness. You remember that? Okay, question number four. The greatest fact which the Bible teaches about God's attitude toward people Remember what it is? Was it his power, or was it his covenant, or was it his love? <laughs> You're smart. Yeah. Question number five deals with a wonderful scripture that you'll get to fill in some words. And it's in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 uh, to 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And he said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Did he say preachers are few, or teachers are few, or laborers are few? You know, we got gobs of preachers, but not many laborers. <laughs> yeah. Question number six. As a representative of Jesus Christ, now see, I'm helping you. But why am I doing this? Not to, dis not to disrespect you, not to... Not to uh, demean your intelligence. We're wanting to learn some things. If we can hit the highlights of what, of the ingredients that go into our attitude, then that's helped us. We're not treating each other like children, but we're, we're learning certain things that, listen friends, will affect your life forever. Did you know this world is filled with preachers and churches that get off in dimensions of uh, super spirituality that have no connection with, 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 with us as a witness to a hurting person that will help that hurting person be better and feel better about themselves. If we don't do that, we're wasting our time. Nobody is interested in a bunch of head knowledge we can fill in on the sides a lot of that for our own entertainment. But when we come to teaching classes in Life Discovery Bible Institute, it's to help people discover life. That's what we're all about. And I think we're richer when we learn the secrets that help people discover what real life is all about. Real life is not head knowledge and getting smart and strutting and bragging. Real life is being happy, blessed, lifted, confident, fulfilled, successful. And real life is imparting those virtues to other people. Okay, so as a representative and ambassador of Jesus Christ in question six, 
Is our mission supposed to be to dominate people, to correct people, to seed people, or to indoctrinate people? Oh, you got it. You're right on, see. Number seven, we'll fill in the missing words, Matthew 13, 38. The field is what? <coughs> well, that one you might have missed, but you've got the reference there, so you'll probably check it out. The field, where is the field? What is the field? What constitutes... Okay, yeah, that's what it is. And Luke 8, 11, what's the seed that we give? What's the seed? Yeah, you're smart. And there's four kinds of soil that we'll seed in. And we can't control the soil. We can only control the seed. I mean, we can choose the seed, I should say. We don't control the seed. We choose the seed. We plant the seed. There's four kinds of soil. And the scripture references are all given here. One is by the by the wayside, one is in stony places, one is among thorns, and one is in good ground. Those are the four kinds of soil. Now, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ restoring the world to himself or renewing the world to himself or reconciling the world to himself. And uh, uh, you're smart. And in uh, uh, question number nine, see, that's very important. A lot of folks, if we have that in our, in our uh, comportment, we'll be reconcilers. If we understand that about seed, we'll understand that you can't go up and whop people over the head with a wet squirrel finger point them and jam them down and hey another point you won't go out and be angry at people when they don't accept what you say you'll come back to your next session or your next church service or your next campaign meeting and you'll love them again and what will you do again to them you'll see them some more see this is very very vital to attitude I know thousands of preachers that haven't caught on, that all we can do is see. You can't dictate. You can't judge. You can't demean. You can't condemn. You can't put people up, put people down. You see. The seed produces the harvest, and it depends on the ground. So you're going to get mad at your thorny ground and whop them over the head and beat them, and demean them and make them feel little. Don't minister like that. Now, attitude. This, the, these ingredients in you as a human person will enhance your success as a leader, as a preacher, as a witness, as a business person. I mean, let's face it, anybody... It, if we had a house full of entrepreneurs here today, they would say, Osborne, you're, you're right on. That's the way you build a business. Seed people, believe in people, lift people, help people, never demean people. Okay, let's go on. According to, yeah, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, have we been given the ministry of reconciliation? So, reconcilers are to put together the differences, iron out the problems so that the relationship between the two can be good. Is that what we do with love, with people who are lost and afraid and scared of God? We come between them and reconcile them and introduce them to Jesus. Hallelujah. Question number nine, we are, a we are ambassadors for Christ, aren't we? That's a pretty heavy word. An ambassador, I wrote down here just to pass on to you today, to impress you more of an ambassador. It's an official, an authorized representative of a sovereign government, an agent of highest rank appointed to represent a government in another nation. We're in another nation. We're of a heavenly kingdom, of a heavenly species, of a heavenly government. I stood up in Embu among the Kikuyus and I preached a whole sermon. I got their attention and I walked out there, stood up very formal 
And I said, I want you people to know that I've come here as a representative of my government. And they listened. Because I looked so important to those Kikuyus anyway, wearing that big African red robe that they just <laughs> love. And uh, it sounded like an ambassador from America. And so, so I told him, I said, my government has authorized me to come here today to give you, to give you some wonderful news. And I told them all about this news about Jesus Christ. And it was, it was awesome to them to hear me talking about Jesus in the context of me representing my government. And at the appropriate time along, so I didn't lead them on too long, I filled them in. I said, now, I'm not talking about my government of America. I'm talking about my government in heaven, the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, Lord, Master, at work in me. I'm representing that government. And oh, the Africans love something like that. Oh, they could get it. And, uh, and then I, I went right through and let them know how that my government had authorized me to bring the good news to everybody that their sins were paid for and that they didn't have to be condemned anymore. I went through that whole thing. It was, it was a context in which they could comprehend the gospel. I caught them off guard and got the gospel to them. And when I got all through, then I quizzed them. A lot of questions. Do you believe? that Jesus Christ went to the cross and did this for you. Did he do this? And was his blood divine? All the, when we got all through, they all answered yes, always. I said, then my government authorizes me to tell you that on the basis of that, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus Christ is pleased to come and live in your life today. And you know, it was awesome to them. And then I led that field of people in a confession. Then, you know, like the guy I brought to Jesus, let down through the roof and the, said, your sins are forgiven. And they said, oh, he can't do that. He said, oh, you couldn't see that miracle. I'll show you one you can see. Get up and walk. You can see that okay. What do you, whether you say one or the other, it's the same. It takes the power of God. You remember the story in Mark chapter 2? Well, when I got all through, I said, now that's all spiritual. You didn't see none of those miracles happen. Let's see if that works the other way. I said, my government authorized me to tell you that your sicknesses are already carried away and that you can be well. And it's for you right now. And it's power from heaven that's here rec ready to be exercised and, 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 and conferred upon you so that if you're a cripple, you don't have to be a cripple. If you're crazy, you don't have to be crazy. If you're blind, you don't have to be blind. Now I went through the whole thing, preached another sermon. I mean, over here, you have to do the whole thing 30 minutes. Out there, you're two or three hours. And uh, got all through, then I, then, then I quizzed them. Do you believe this, 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 this? Do you believe he bore your sickness? Do you believe he bore your sins, you, your, your pains? Do you believe he took your diseases? Do you believe he was striped? He bore the stripes for your healing. Do you believe that? And I made that real clear, whole message. Then I said, then my government authorizes me to tell you that you are healed now. So I had a brief confession, I believe, you know, and took them through those steps. Then I said, now, all you have to do is just put your faith into action. And let's see if that works. And did you know what? In five minutes, there were crutches and wheelchairs and, and, and cots being raised up over the heads of the people all over the audience. They were healed. Why did I say that? I'm talking about question number nine. We are ambassadors for Christ. An official, authorized representative of a sovereign government, the kingdom of God. We're an agent of highest rank appointed to represent that wonderful government in this government. No wonder we can go out there with, with TC. TC? Is it two TC? Yeah. No wonder we can go out there with them. As hosts, we represent a government of power, of peace, of tranquility. And it works. It works in you. Attitude. Okay? Question number 10. The gospel must first be preached or published or proclaimed among all nations. Mark 13, 10. You can figure out which one it is. <clears throat> well, of course, we know that it's good to do all of them. That's just to, to help you check a scripture. It's published. Question 11. Write the verses in 2 Corinthians 5 which summarize the message that we are to give the world. 
Never forget. Look, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he, person be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things become new. Verse 18, all things are of God who's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit. That's old English. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the way it is, colon. This is what we do, colon. To wit. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now has committed us the ministry of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Verse 21. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now you take your pick among those and write it in on your exam paper. It'll pass. Whatever you feel is the essence of what we're to give the world. Right. It's right in there. Verse 12. There's two verses in the Bible, Revelation 7, 9 and 14, 6. What do they mean to your ministry as a witness? One of them says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could, no person could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb, from everywhere they were there. What does that tell you as a witness? It tells me that I can go anywhere, any nation, any, any people, any time, anywhere, and give the gospel of Jesus, get people saved, because they're going to be there from all over the world. Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. What does that say to you as a witness? Does that say to you, I've got to go in a corner and pray for a vision from God to tell me what country to go to? Or does it tell you, that tells me I can pick my choice and go get them. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you write in what it means to you. It might mean something different to you. Whatever it means to you, that's the right answer. Uh, question 13. Paul gave strong counsel to Timothy to be a good example of the believer, and he specified six ways. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And that's right there in the verse, and the reference is given to you. Verse, uh, uh, question 14. What are the two motivations that we've emphasized for winning? Any of you remember that? One, we're motivated to what? To minister. Or we're motivated to manipulate. Always keep that in mind. Did you know that'll be a guiding light to you in all of your Christian witnessing? Am I motivating them for my good, or am I ministering to them for their good. Very important. You see preachers supposed to, people supposed to represent Christ, but they've got some ax to grind or something to sell or some business to promote, and you can see those dollar signs dancing in their eyes every time they talk about Jesus. That's not good. Well, thank God the gospel's preached. That's all right. But, uh, but it's sure better to minister. That means help someone else. Motivate means help me. You help me. We want to help them. Amen? In Acts, 5, in Acts 8 and 18, it talks about Simon the sorcerer. There's a question there about the, uh, that. Which, uh, what, what motivated him? Simon the sorcerer. It says, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this power that on whoever I lay hands they may receive the Holy Ghost. He liked that. <clears throat> In Acts 16 is another case. A demon-possessed girl was healed. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her master's great gain by soothsaying. 
They were manipulating her for their own advantage. Verse 19 of chapter 16, when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace. The hope of their gain was gone. <clears throat> we don't want to ever minister from that standpoint, do we? Acts 19 is the case of Demetrius, the silversmith. Verse 24, a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. And Paul's about to mess up our business. Dollar signs were motivating them. What was their motivation? Let's go to question number 18. A nice verse in 1 Timothy 1.12. I thank Christ Jesus our... Who? Our Lord. Who has done what to us? Enabled us. For that he counted me... How? Faithful. Faithful. He counted me faithful. Putting me into the... The ministry. Hallelujah. I love that verse. The project of winning has pre been presented within the framework of three statements. People instead of a pedestal. We're going to ask you to state what that means to you. Gospel instead of gusto. What does that mean to you? Anointing instead of adorning. We're going to ask you to give some Bible verses that uh, that uh, represent that to you. I listed Luke 4.18. I thought that was a good one. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me because He's anointed me to do good things to people. Amen? I like that. What's the difference in anointing and adorning? I listed 1 John 2, verse 27. The anointing which you've received of Him abides in you. I like that verse. I like 1 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now He which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit of our of the spirit in our hearts but you may find other verses that mean a lot to you that's all right Ch uh, uh, question 20 Isaiah 10:27 has some missing words in it on your questionnaire the yoke shall be destroyed because of what the anointing. Oh, hallelujah for the anointing and hallelujah. We can break every yoke. You believe that? Amen. Without the anointing, we won't break the yoke. Question 21. In, in talking about the paycheck of winning our world, three statements were repeated to summarize this portion of our teaching. Number one, Christ is actualized. We're asking you to give some scriptures about that. What, or what does it mean to you? You know, Christ is actualized. Well, you know, I like uh, John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. I like Ephesians 1, 22, He's put all things under His feet and given Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. I like that verse. Christ is actualized in people when we minister to people and get them reconciled to God. Christ is put into action. Every time we make a convert, Christ is birthed again in another person. The more people we can get out here in this world with Jesus alive in them, the better. That's why we witness. Colossians 3 says, and have put on the new man, the new person, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor uncircumcision, bond, uh, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Say that together. Christ, Christ is all and in all. That's what we want to happen to people. Christ becomes actualized in a person. Like, uh, yesterday, LaDonna said one of those uh, persons that had just come into TCTC and was allowed to come out there. LaDonna was mixing among them, and this lady very said she pulled up a very religious and proper and strong defensive front, you know, to talk with her. And LaDonna just talked to her a little bit, loved her a little bit, 
said some nice things to her. And all of a sudden, said she just broke into tears and grabbed LaDonna. And she says, this is the craziest thing I've ever said in my life. But you've made me want to be saved. Can you help me? That's her word. Right out there at the picnic. Christ is actualized. Very valuable if we have the right attitude. Number two, you, number two, you are, no, people are evangelized. Isn't that beautiful? How can people know about God? How can people come to God if they don't hear the gospel of what Christ has done for them? So when we evangelize them, they can come to God. People are evangelized. The gospel is the power that converts them. Number three, you are energized. Isn't that wonderful? We've asked you, what does that mean to you? Well, uh, you, you just write down what that means to you. And, 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 and your answer will be good. Question 22, in studying the context of winning, we emphasized Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the dominion of God. We gave it in that version. I don't know exactly which version that is either, but it's the essence of the meaning. King James, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Uh, no, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be added unto you. Now, this version, seek first the essence, seek first the dominion of God and your right standing in that and all these things be added. See, you'll get everything from God when you discover God's kingdom and you're right standing in it so you're not afraid, you're not ashamed, you're happy, you walk with God, you're his ambassador, you're on good speaking terms, you're in good relation with him, you're his friend, he's your friend, he believes in you, you believe in him, in him. you got good standing. All things are added to you. Boy, the devil's got a poor devil when you discover that. So we're asking you here, uh, where is God's dominion? Think about that. Say, so I think I know. Say, so I'm sure I know. Hallelujah. It's in me. Glory to God. Isn't that beautiful? Question 23. Give two Bible verses which express your right standing in God's sight. Now, I don't know what verses you might like. I wrote down Romans 5, 1. Romans 8, 1. John 3, 16. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. And Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, and there's lots more of them. I don't know which ones you may want to write down. But write down the ones that mean to you, you have right standing with God. Number 24, God had a dream. What single word embodies God's dream? Isn't it wonderful to review these things? People, people. One single word embodies God's dream. Well, what's your dream? <laughs> what do you, uh, and verse, uh, chapter, how many times am I going to do that? Question 26. Since God's dream concerns people, what single word expresses what God wants to do most to people? Think about that. That God wants people to have. What single word does God want most for people? Well, that's what I wrote down good. And then I wrote a bunch of scriptures in Deuteronomy 30. And verse 9, Jeremiah 32, verses 38 to 41, that'll start you off. I rejoice over them to do them good with my whole heart and my whole soul. But you may find some other verses as good. What does God want to do? What do you want to do for people? See what this review is doing in your ministry. You don't want to manipulate. You don't want to earn people. You don't want to power over people. You don't want to govern people. You don't want to stomp on people. You don't want to manipulate people. You don't want to use people. You want to help people discover good so they'll be happier, successful. You win by them winning. You gain by their gain. You don't gain by siphoning from them. It don't work that way. Attitude for ministry. Question 28. According to Genesis 1, 27 to 31, so you've got the reference right there. God gave to both man and woman five things. Equality, ability, 
superiority, authority, and prosperity, and that ought to make you a minister that respects womankind on the same level of mankind. And from my experience, your ministry and your life and your marriage will be happier when you discover the equality of women in God's plan. Try to discover that. We are products, men, of a culture, of a society, and of a religious stance that teaches us and emphasizes that women are inferior, subservient, and that they must acquiesce to the male dominance, which is wrong. God's original plan and God's redemptive plan does not endorse that. Now, we don't want to insist that. We're not browbeating you about that. We're just welcoming you to gain knowledge. If, it's, if you're honest, if it's Bible, let's accept it. And my experience, you'll be happier. You can write down the parts of the verses that impress you most. Question 29. Give three scripture references which emphasize that God wants only good for people. That's nice. I wrote down Psalm 70 and 1. You can check these out. Psalms 100, verse 5. Psalms 119, verse 68. Deuteronomy 28, verse 65. Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. And verse 9. And verse 15, Deuteronomy 28 and 30, some good ones. Psalms 84, 11. You want some more? Ephesians 1, 5. Luke 2, 14. 1 Thessalonians 1, 11. Hebrews 9, 11. James 1, 17. You know, the, the, to hear a lot of preachers and teachers and Christians, they'd be hard put to find a scripture that says God just wants good for people. Because they're used, so used to God being out after people to get people and browbeat people and condemn people and put people down. You know, there's people that just love David Wilkerson's book about judgment on America. They just love all those mean scriptures. I don't like them. I'm so glad we're not in that dispensation. I resent bringing all that mean stuff up in the dispensation of grace and heaping that on us to spook people. I resent that. Yeah, you're smart. <laughs> what does gospel mean? Question 30. Yeah, what? Uh, 31. Give three scripture references that emphasize that God is not mad at people. And that believers need not fear judgment nor live under guilt or condemnation. That's a good one, isn't it? See, if we'll focus on those kind of issues, our attitudes in ministry will be totally different. And I wrote down John 3, 18, Romans 8 and 1, John 5, 24, Romans 8, 34, Isaiah 43, 25, Isaiah 44, 22, Micah 7, 18, 1 John 1 and 9, Matthew 26, 28. Well, there's hundreds of others. But I just, to guide you and help you along, I thought that'd be nice. Let's see, that's question 31. Question 32, in studying the context of winning, we summarize the essence of practical, vibrant Christianity by the statement, God is spirit, people are his flesh. Say that out loud. God is spirit, people are his flesh. Has that blessed you? Yes. Well, we wrote, the question is, what does it mean to you? So your answer will be right. What does it mean to you? Question 33, give three scripture references that confirm that statement. And I wrote down a whole bunch of them. I wrote down first, you better, you want to write these down? First John 4, 15. Oh boy, God dwelleth in them. Uh, first, uh, uh, John 14, 16 and 17. You better write these down because I, I want you to never forget this, this list of scriptures. First Corinthians 3, 16. God dwells in you. That other one, he shall be in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 
Holy Ghost which is in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16, I will dwell in them. Ephesians 2.22, we're built as a habitation of God. Uh, Romans 8.11, if His Spirit dwells in us. 1 John 3.24, He abides in you. 1 John 4.13, we dwell in Him. He dwells in us. Oh, are you getting so happy that you can't hardly hang on to your seat? Me too. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, 20, I am with you. John 17, 21, you're in me and I am in you. You'll be one in me. John 17, 26, I in them. John 14, 20, you in me, I in you. John 14, 23, we'll make our abode with you. 1 John 4, 12, God dwells in us. Hallelujah. I'm hurrying. Question 26. Oh, wait, I'm through. Wait, that was the last one. No, no, I'm not through. No, that, that was for question 32 and 33. Question 34. Me, who is Christ's body today? I read my answer first. <laughs> Say me. me. Us. Us. All believers. A Christian. Question 35, name some practical ways in which Christ lives and ministers through humans today. And question 36, in, in this first course of winning our world, what has happened to you or what scriptural verse or truth has been better focused to influence you to share more in ministering love to a hurting world?